Harris Hackney speaker, with um, John Morrissey from Daniel Mike Galway, John Foucault and the Colonial Complex Emergent Forum for Colonial Governmentality in Early Modern Ireland. Thanks, Richie. Um, first of all, just a thank you to, to Jerry for organising this, this um, really great day so far. It seems like it's the 40th event of the 40th anniversary, so <laughs> really good work, Jerry. Um, this paper is, is sort of an unusual gestation in a way. Um, I, I've recently completed a master's in education where I've critiqued the sort of architecture of performance measurements in universities, and I've been immersed in the subject of subjectivity and governmentality. So in many ways, what I'm really trying to do here um, for a book for that Paddy Duffy is editing is to try to think about questions of governmentality and subjectivity in the context of early colonial Ireland, where I think what, what we're really seeing, what I'm going to try and argue today, is early colonial prototypes of the kinds of population management techniques that Foucault argued happened much later in the 18th century. Um, Part of what my sort of motivation for this is reading the kinds of work like, like Judith Butler, where she describes subjection as literally the making of a subject. Um, the principle of regulation, in other words, according to which a subject is formulated or produced, and such subjection is a kind of power that not only unilaterally acts on a given individual as a form of domination, but also activates, and that's a really cr crucial word, which I'll come back to through the course of the paper, or forms a subject. And this connects very closely as well with Foucault's sort of his very late, the last word before he died, um, on subjection, where he talks about subjection being the making of subject um, as well. But he argues that political, ethical, and indeed philosophical problems are days not to try to liberate the individual from the state, but from the type of individualization and subjection, which he argues elsewhere, is linked to the state. And I think what he's trying to argue here is that that subjection, that process of subjection, has been um, imposed on us for several, cen several centuries. So what I'm going to try and do now is to, you're wondering, I'm going to talk about um, performance measurement in universities. No, thank God. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, specifically, uh, the policy of surrender and regrets in the late 16th century and early 17th century. Um, and I'm going to draw specifically on these two recently translated lectures of Michel Foucault. In geography and related disciplines, these two translations have prompted a number of reflections on uh, historical relations between sovereign power and what Foucault calls biopower, which he defines broadly as the technologies or techniques of government that developed in Western societies to secure and regulate populations. In his broad canon of work, however, Foucault's writings have largely ignored or not engaged um, colonial contexts. So what I want to argue here is that in many ways what we're seeing in early, early colonial Ireland are the kinds of population management techniques that Foucault later ascribes to 18th century continental Europe. My intention, in other words, is to consider new English governmental strategies to activate, in Judith Butler's words, a type of colonial subject as part of a new capitalist colonial economy, whilst simultaneously to eliminate the conduct of the existing Gaelic population. And I'm going to focus specifically on the tactic of surrendering the grant in terms of it being a tactic to effectively quantify and regulate and activate economic subjects under the common law. To argue that Foucault's predominant gaze in Western Europe, and particularly his native France, resulted in colonial societies being overlooked is not entirely true. As Steve Legg has argued, um, colonial societies did to some extent inform his conceptualization of the metropole. And indeed, he acknowledged that the techniques of government and security that, he, that the European powers tested in the colonies were, were in fact brought back to the West. Foucault called this the boomerang effect. And indeed, I'm arguing here that many of the governmental techniques that Foucault claimed to define modern European state systems saw their development in early modern European colonial societies such as Ireland. Defines or theorized governmentality as the strategies and procedures that facilitate a mode of governmental power that has the population as its target, political economy as its major form of knowledge, and apparatuses or techniques of securitization as its essential and technical instrument. Now, I think the concept is useful in three ways in considering the emergence of colonial governmental techniques in early modern Ireland. The first is the colonial government were explicitly seeking to actively shape the conduct of the target population. And the strategy of surrendering and grant, which I'll show in a second, is a very useful example to illustrate this. 
The Tudor and Early Stewart, secondly, the Tudor and Early Stewart administrations in Ireland were focused on enabling governable subjects in an emergent capitalist political economy. Again, exemplified, I would argue, by the tactic of surrender and regrants. And finally, the evolving governmental technologies of early modern Ireland, early modern colonial Ireland, can be read, I think, as early exemplars of what Foucault saw as modernity's desire to anticipate and plan for society's uncertain future, what he called the aleatory. Focusing on the anticipatory tactics that sought to reform and recast the early modern <coughs> subject enables us to see how the newly mapped colonial spaces of, of, of early modern Ireland presented a new order with what Foucault calls a milieu or field of intervention that required planning for the uncertain by what Judith Butler calls literally the making of the subject. And that subject needed to be knowable, summarily knowable, regulated and secured, and crucially too, mobilised in the context of a capitalist colonial economy. Okay, so to surrender in grants. Colonial administrators in early modern Ireland were tasked effectively with governing various aspects of a colonial milieu that they did not know. Mapping and scripting this new space involved multiple government agents, some of whom we've already heard of earlier on, actively playing a part in the production and registering of new knowledges, all oriented towards the development of a new political economy. Ireland was geographed, in other words, towards this, towards this colonial endgame. Now, the colonial spaces presented crown officials with a field of intervention where the challenge of affecting colonial and activating colonial subjects lay in what Foucault calls the problem of circulation and causality. Michael Dillon, indeed, has argued that the key instrument of securing and governing populations is the science of statistics and probability. As he makes clear, you cannot secure anything unless you know what it is, which prompts the necessary translation of people, territory, and things into epistemic objects. And that is precisely what occupied those tasks with knowing, quantifying, and transforming um, Gaelic Ireland in the Tudor and Stuart administrations of the early modern period. And seeing surrender and regret as essentially an anticipatory governmental tactic, I'm thinking the ways in which populations are rendered as both objects of management and political subjects called upon to, to quote Foucault to conduct itself in such and such a fashion. For new English administration in early modern Ireland, it was precisely the subjection and regulation of a new colonial population that was central to its tactics of securing a new political economy. The prevailing colonial discourse on Gaelic Ireland in the 16th and early 17th centuries involved, on the one hand, the, the, the denunciation of the various political, economic, and cultural productions of Gaeldom, and on the other hand, the identification and legitimation of remedial governmental measures. In other words, it equated to a determinist binary that neatly juxtaposed disorder, volatility, and threat with intervention, remedy, and security. A binary, as we all know, that still functions as, power, as a very powerfully persuasive logic for interventionism today, military and otherwise. Gaelic material practices, such as coin library and so on, were perennially presented as the reasons for the lack of political order and economic enterprise. Sir John Davies, for example, um, one slide, sorry. Uh, this is Fines Morrison, an incredibly interesting individual, by the way, who, who wrote these incredible treatises on Ireland. He was a personal secretary to Lord Mountjoy. The kinds of discourses of Gaelic Ireland are very clear in, in, in the writings of Morrison, Spencer, and others. But I want to, to, to quote Davies here. Um, Davies argued uh, that customs such as coin library and so on made their Gaelic customs um, possessions uncertain, being shuffled and changed so often by new elections and partitions, and were the true causes of such desolation and barbarism in this land. And the remedial measures in it, of course, were in turn directed to affect both political and economic subject formation. See the Lord Deputy of Ireland, uh, Sir John Perrault, declaring in 1589 that the surrender of their land and taking the same back, again, must breed quietness, obedience, and profit. And I think it is this logic of economic remedy stimulus that is often overlooked in critiques of contemporary English colonial discourse and practice. If you look at town charters from across the late 16th, late, late 16th century, um, throughout Ireland for instance, what you get is a clear juxtapositioning of stimming Gaelic economic productions with progressive ec English economic enterprise. And of course the logic of remedial socio-economic development and improvement also lent itself to more violent efforts to fashion a new colonial economy by planting subjects from Britain, as, as was made clear in the plans for the first large-scale Tudor plantation in Ireland in the 1580s, the Munster Plantation. 
Um, and in that, of course, you also uh, have an opening up of, of a landmark, which I'll come back to in a second. So here's Sir William Herbert, who's the uh, chief undertaker in said monster plantation. Our pretense in the enterprise of plantation was to establish in these parts piety, justice, inhabitation, and civility, with comfort and good example to the parts adjacent. Our drift now is being here possessed of land, to extort, to make the state of things turbulent, and live by prey and pay. And that's a, a theme which very much returns when, we, when I'm going to talk about the, the, the adventurers in, in the later um, uh, early part of the 17th century. I want to look in more detail now at one area of Munster in, in County Tipperary which affords, I think, a really illuminating insight into uh, the consequences of English efforts to affect political and economic colonial subjectivity in early modern Ireland. The focus here is on the other war clan and their colonial encounters in West County Tipperary, which is here. Um, and uh, what, what I'm really interested in, in trying to uh, map here is the ways in which the, the other wires were mobilized gradually as colonial subjects. 1540 it begins, an indenture took place between King Henry VIII and the chief of the, of the other wires, in which the chief agreed to pay a sum of money out of every caracut of land and find 40 galavasses for a month for the then burgeoning new English administration in Tipperary. It was the beginning of a long series of colonial interactions that saw the other wires gradually become mobilized as colonial subjects. Now some three generations later, in 1607, a defining development took place in the surrender and regrant of the then Odoir chief, Dermot Odoir. Odoir set out his intention, it's the, the survey map of Kilman on top there. Um, Here's Odoir writing to Archie, Sir Archie Chichester, um, the Lord Edward Ireland in 1607, and this is two months before his, his surrender in the grant. Um, I here would request to surrender to His Majesty all my lands and seigneuries and have the same in grant and hold of His Majesty by English tenure, and thereby to reduce my country, being all Irish, to civility, and for as much as the best means thereto is to have the true use and execution of the common law, which is wanting there. Of course, set out his intention, I think, to reduce his country to civility by effectively a dual legal economic strategy. Firstly, affirming his property rights by English tenure and having the legal arm of the colonial government operative in his lordship, and secondly, by initiating a new market economy. He was, in other words, embracing the opportunity to have his territory socially and economically regulated, not from within, but from without. And his understanding, I think, of the need for economic enterprise in the new order is clear too taking the role of improving landlord. He further petitions, not quoting here, um, that he may hold the court lease and court baron, two yearly fairs, a weekly market, and have all the profits and privileges thereof." End quote. That particular pitch secured all of those requests in the surrender and grant of June 1607. Similar to surrender and grant agreements right across the country in the early 17th century, Odoir's agreement solidified a new colonial subjectivity within his lordship. And the most critical change, I think, was undoubtedly the legal framing of a new landlord tenant local economy, in which the chief rents were payable by a new tenant class. The legal designating and standardizing of tenant dues equated to the remedial reduction and regulation of what was deemed detri detrimental to effective governmentality, which were arbitrary Gaelic customs of service. And this logic of improvement was crucially persuasive, I think, for the Gaelic Lords, as Paddy Duffy has argued um, previously. Precisely because, as Judith Butler um, argued, subjection is about a, is, it's a kind of power that not only unilaterally acts on a given individual as a form of domination, but also activates or forms a particular type of subject. The governmental measure of surrender and grant ultimately serves to affect a new colonial subjectivity in the Gaelic Lordships. The policy's architects and supporters had long envisaged for an expressly economic endgame. Crown Council to Irish Fairs, right throughout this period, Richard Hatter, for example, in his discourse to King James I in 1604, had promoted the extension of the policy to break the dependence of Irish landholders on their traditional le leaders and to bring them into direct tenurial relationship with the Crown. Now, very soon afterwards, the Commission for Surrenders was uh, established in 1605 with the explicit purpose of extending the policy. I think it was instrumental in extending the new colonial political economy, but it also had a profound impact um, on the power relations of the Gaelic lordships, not only reordering existing Gaelic landholding, tenurial, and social structures, but in doing so too, 
to elicit agrarian unrest. I want to talk a little bit about that agrarian unrest. I think that's really the fracture that we see in Gaelic Ireland at this point. 1609, two years after, the, the main chief surrendering in Brent gets, gets his lands by, by English tenure. And in 1611, the other two foremost for, uh, former freeholders in, in the barony, Conor O'Dwyer and John O'Dwyer, secured individual land buildings for the Crown. Both took advantage of the Commission for the Remedy of Defective Titles that had also been set up in 1605. This commission, on the back of the, of the Commission for, for Surrenders, not only served to accelerate the extension of private property rights and individualization, but added to the general anxiety of pre-existing landholders and freeholders, who were increasing, increasingly coming under pressure to conform their holdings in courts. Many failed, of course, resulting in the forfeiture and, and redistribution of substantial land tracts throughout the country. The privatization of property rights safeguarded by statute law was pivotal to attracting large numbers of British settlers, venture capitalists, and entrepreneurs to early 17th century Ireland. My colleague in, in Galway, Nicholas Canny, suggests that as many as 100,000 migrated to Ireland during the years 1603 to 1641. And the opening up of that landmark had two crucial effects, I think. First is the kind of individualization that began to define Gaelic landholding aspirations. A series of landholding uh, government inquisitions, for example, land disputes and property tra transactions marked the war lordship right throughout the 1620s and 1630s, during which time 15 subordinate Odoara clansmen were involved in legal battles to secure their respective landholdings individually. Completely unheard of uh, 10 years previous to this. At, sure, at this juncture, land leases, mortgages, and acquisitions were, were also commonplace. The second element, which I think is important here, is the burgeoning land market began to attract moneyed colonial entrepreneurs from England. Okay, I was looking over my notes there a few minutes ago and I realized I've got two Harry Potter titles to these slides. Here's the first. So it's Sir Philip Percival and the Adventurers. Um, there's another one to come, it's even worse. But anyway, um, the suddenly cited and yet I think richly informative England manuscripts illustrate the insidious impact of the adventurers in 17th century Ireland. Um, here's the second slide, I'm going to fast forward because I'm running out of time. Um, so here's Sir Philip Percival and half subjects. Um, Sir Philip Percival is a man who's been chronicled in the Egyptian manuscripts, and he is literally one of the most, um, you know, foremost speculators of all of the adventurers in, in early 17th century Ireland. He held a whole series of powerful and lucrative offices, including Kirk and Register of the Court of Wards, and so on. He established a large um, estate in Burton in, in County Cork in 1637. Okay. Um, I want to draw your attention before the last two or three minutes though to this exchange between one of the major Odoir landowners, Charles Odoir in 1637, and Percival, where he's actually canvassing and asking Percival to buy lands in that neighbourhood as the inhabitants are so fired by the relation of the coming plantation that they will sell upon very easy rates. I think this exchange is instructive to the profound impact of the colonial government's success in activating a particular type of economic colonial subjectivity. In order to, to survive, the you know, Odoir landowners were facing down a threat externally or further plantations. Of course, at this point, you had Lord Deputy of Ireland, Sir Thomas Wentworth, expressly signalling um, future plantations and internally of, of agrarian unrest from their subordinates. Um, the, the old collective clan hold, land holding structure, in other words, and associated social order had been remedially recast at this point. And what comes into view, I think, is an early modern example of the transformative effects of a colonial governmental governmentality designed to activate a colonial economic subject. Okay, I'll try to conclude. Um, I've got a minute, have I? I've got two, better. Okay, I should have stayed on the Harry Potter slides now. Um, Catherine Gibson and the late Judy Graham have shown how the concept of subjection allows us to see subjects as made and as making themselves in and through practices of governmentality. I think the other warriors in early 17th century Ireland are an early example of what Gibson and Graham refer to as, as reluctant subjects. By the time of the 1641 Irish Rebellion, their historic lordship had been irrevocably transformed. For the other and so many others, surrender and regret had legally laid the framework for the wholesale dispossessions of post Cromwellian in Ireland and its extension of privatised property rights had generated the type of individualisation and economic subjectivity which, in one of his last writings before his death, Foucault lamented as the lingering political, ethical and philosophical problems of our days. 
Drawing on Foucault, I think, and using the example of early modern Ireland, what I've tried to do here is to reveal the colonial antecedents of modern forms of governmentality and practices of subjection. Focusing on the Irish colonial policy of surrender and regret, I sought to interrogate the gradual emergence of regulatory apparatuses of government that served to affect the population by activating a particular type of economic subjectivity in a new market economy. At its core, surrender and regret's essential strategy of governmentality, activating an economic colonial subject, ultimately saw Gaelic Ireland reduced and recast, and a new colonial economy emerge, characterized by individualization and capitalist accumulation.